Daniel, and if you still have the handout, how many of you still have the handout? I'm just going to go there. How many of you still have the handout that I gave out about Daniel months ago? Oh, I guess i got to run 50 more. Okay. <laughs> the title of my message this morning is Relevance with People Follows Reverence for God. What does it mean to be relevant? Talk to me. What does it mean to be relevant? Relate. It relates, or we can relate to it. Okay. Anything else? What's part of the definition of relevance? Appropriate for the situation. Sorry, Benny, the first part? Appropriate for the situation. Appropriate for the situation. Okay. Um, along those lines, um, go a little deeper into the appropriateness. Appropriate how? For what? Especially for that time, right? Because things that were relevant in the 50s, not so much anymore, right? Things that were relevant in the 70s, not so much anymore, okay? And someday, things that are relevant to us today will be, no, I don't think so, okay? <laughs> Time marches on. So, relevance with people follows reverence. What is reverence for God? What is reverence? Respect. Respect is part of it? Honor. Honor. Particularly with God, out of reverence we do what? Worship. Worship Him. Live for Him. So, relevance with people, if we want to be relevant with people, what must come first is reverence for God. If we want to have a long lasting impact, a long lasting influence with people, there's nothing wrong with being relevant. That's all good. But to have a long lasting influence, we must first of all be reverent before God because it is He who will help us be relevant. We see that in Daniel's life. Relevance is a byproduct of of reverence. If you want to be relevant to culture, you must first be reverent to God. Reverence means fearing God and not man. Worshiping, respecting, seeking to please and honor him. All words that you used here just a few moments ago. Honoring him above anything or anyone else. An attitude of reverence is part of our inner transformation. When we ask Christ to forgive our sins, reverence toward God is one of the things that changes in our life, that he builds into our life. Daniel was a very reverent man. He made decisions in his life based on his fear of God. Can you say that about yourself? The major decisions you make in your life, did you consider God first? A job change, that spouse you marry, timing of having your kids, all those big decisions. But you know what, even the little decisions as well. Do we make them out of reverence, with reverence for God? Daniel avoided the king's food. Remember when he and his friends and the other um, Jews were taken into exile in Babylon? Those who were going to work for the king... We're supposed to eat the king's fare. We're allowed to eat the king's fare, which was pretty much anything they wanted. Daniel and his friends chose to eat what instead? Vegetables. Vegetables. They basically were vegan. And when the period of time ended that the test was being run on the, the different types of food that was eaten, Daniel and his friends were much healthier than the ones who'd had anything and everything they wanted. But Daniel risked that. He continued to pray at the risk of punishment. The king had built a huge statue of himself and demanded that all the people bow and worship that statue. Daniel, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow to that statue. They took that risk. Now, be honest with yourself. If you had been in their situation, would you have bowed the knee and said to God in your heart, I, I, I'm not bowing in my heart. But everybody there is seeing you bow your knee. So you're a fake. You're being a hypocrite. They weren't hypocrites. Daniel con confronted the king, risking his position. Daniel made his decisions based on his fear of God. And I don't mean fear being afraid. I mean fear, reverence, awe, worship. So should we. So should we. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare. In other words, it's a trap. If we seek to please people first or only, we're going to get trapped. Sometime, somehow, by something. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. And that happened for Daniel and his friends. Daniel's reverence paved the way for his relevance. And he was able to meet the real spiritual needs of the people around him. He and his friends knew that the same God who transformed them from the inside out was the only God to whom they would ever bow. God was their life, and he deserved their reverence. On the sheet, one of the quotes was, Those who bow in reverence to God and leave the results to him will become relevant in his time and in his way. Perhaps these four young men thought back to Noah, who chose, chose, chose is a huge word. Obeying God, serving God, worshiping God doesn't come naturally necessarily. We have to choose. It's a daily choice. I am going to live for God. I am going to believe God's word. It's a daily choice. Sometimes it's a moment-by-moment -moment choice. Noah chose to obey God by building the ark, even though he looked completely irrelevant and ridiculous. Hebrews 11.7 says this, and I think this is the first time I've ever noticed this. I mean, I've read it, obviously, but notice this word sequence. It says, by faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark. In reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Why was building an ark an act of reverence? Because it was an act of obedience to what God had told him to do. That was an act of reverence. Every time we obey God, we are reverencing him. Every time we obey God, it's an act of worship. Every time we obey God, well, maybe not every time, but most every time, it's an act of faith because Noah was warned by God about things not yet seen. So we might think, well, what's the big deal about building a boat? Oh, okay, it was a big boat. But still, what's the deal? What's the big deal about building a boat? Well, God told him to build it because it was going to rain. Rain? What is rain? It had never rained before this time. It says the earth was watered by a mist. Have you ever gone out some mornings, maybe? It used to happen in Minnesota where you'd go out in the morning, and because of the dew on the grass, there would be steam rising from the grass, okay? Air, steam, 
It's all, I mean, H2O. The earth was watered by a mist. It had never rained. What is rain? So he's building, 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 hammering, hammering, hammering. People walk by. Hey, Noah, what you doing? I'm building a boat. What's a boat? Well, you put it in the water and you can, you can walk in it. You can live in it. You can move around in it. Well, wh what water? Where is there enough water to do that? You're going to go out in the ocean and do that? Can you imagine the conversations that came Noah's direction during this time that he was building the ark to save him and his family from something that had never happened before? There had never been a flood before because it had never rained before. There was never that much water in one place before except for the ocean. Noah seemed pretty irrelevant at that point, like whacked might come to mind. But he kept building out of reverence. In reverence, he continued building. It didn't even make sense to him because <laughs> he'd never seen rain before either. But he believed God. He obeyed God, and that was counted as righteousness to him. Because he believed God and he obeyed God. When we do that, when we believe God, when we take him at his word and we obey him, it's an act of reverence on our part as well. Even if it doesn't make sense to people around us, even if people ridicule us, even if people reject us, and it doesn't make sense even to us, it is reverence when we obey God. And it pleases God. If Noah had focused on being relevant to his culture, then he never would have built the boat. Why? <laughs> because when your goal is relevance, you focus more on strategy, doing what makes sense. Did it make sense to build a boat that was a few football fields big? We're not talking a canoe. We're talking one that at least two elephants can ride on, okay? Because God later called him to bring in two of every creature. Now, I'm not sure why he brought geckos. I'm not sure why he brought spiders, but he did. Okay? <laughs> Except the geckos will eat the spiders, right? Can you imagine... After a little while, I'm sure Noah was going, hmm, did I want to be a zookeeper? Did I ever ask to be a zookeeper? <laughs> Sometimes when we obey God, this just occurred to me. God will ask us to do things we don't necessarily want to do. But if they need to get done and we're the one there, then God is calling us to do that. God will help us do that. If he'd focused on being relevant, he wouldn't have built the boat. Because if relevance is our goal, we'll focus more on strategy, doing what makes sense, than on the spirit, doing what God commands. Noah could easily have gotten distracted from doing what God had told him to do. If nothing else, listening to the people around him, listening to them discourage him instead of encourage him, make fun of him instead of praising him, thanking him. On our sheet, one of the quotes is, Christians should focus on the Spirit, capital S, doing what pleases God before they focus on strategy, doing what makes sense to man. Noah didn't lean on his own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Believe me, Noah was trusting in God with all his heart because what he was doing did not make sense physically. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding because at best, our understanding is limited. Our understanding 
understanding has an earthly whatever about it. Because that's all we know. But let me ask you this. When that first drop of rain fell, don't you think Noah was the most relevant man on the planet? Because who else had a boat to run into? He and his fellow zookeepers. He and his wife and his sons and their wives. Is it? Then came the zebras and the elephants and the peacocks. As I was preparing this message, I heard somebody else talk about, and I was reminded of the sons of Issachar. Issachar was the ninth son of Jacob. How many did Jacob have? Twelve. This is number nine. First Chronicles chapter 12 talks about the sons of Issachar. And what was outstanding about them, it says that they understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. Church, if there was ever, ever a time for God's people to be like the sons of Issachar and know what in the world is going on, it is now and it is us. Church, stay relevant with the news. And may I add, not just any news, because some of it is whacked. Some of it is downright false. Don't be duped. We need to know our times. And we need to know in these times what we should do and not do. With very practical things like our kids' education, like our finances, like a whole lot of stuff. Daily stuff. Because times are changing. And it has changed fast enough in the last 10 years to make our heads spin. The values, the behavior, the attitudes in our nation have changed so fast, it will make our heads spin. So we need to be holding a Bible in one hand like never before as we watch the news, as we read the news. Does anybody still read the newspaper? I don't know. As you read your phone, have a Bible in one hand because stuff is happening that Jesus said would happen before he returned. It's happening. It is happening. Have you heard anything about Israel lately? Keep your eye on Israel. Keep your eye on the Middle East. Church, church, look what's happening in North Korea. Look what's happening in Russia. Look what's happening in Iran and Iraq. Look what is happening in America. This is being recorded, so I will be careful, but. Have you heard the words lately, the worst president in the entire history of America? I didn't make that up. I, I had nothing to do with that. It's hard to watch, but church, we must know our times like the sons of Issachar. For Jesus to come back, stuff like this has to happen. America has to get uncomfortable. It just has to happen. Just so happens, it's happening <laughs> while we're happening. It's happening in our times. Know the times and the seasons. Listen to what Jesus said would happen before he returns. Because some of it's happening right now.
on our sheet, another quote says, Christians should never focus on the frowns of people, but on the face of God. In other words, what people think, what people say is not what matters most because we're all limited at best in what we know, especially about the future. A whole lot of people know a whole lot of things about history because it's happened. Future, the wise thing is listen to Jesus. Reverence makes God and his word the absolute standard by which all things are measured. It's hard to wrap our minds around, but God is already in the future. God is everywhere and all times present. That's what makes him God and us not. Relevance puts man first, asking, what do people think? What's popular? What's trending? Choosing relevance first is rooted in the fear of man. Reverence, however, considers God first, asking, what does God think? What pleases God? How would he have me act? We need to ask some questions if we want to live faithfully. Just a couple weeks ago, we talked about having a Christian worldview, seeing the world as God sees it, seeing it according to his word, seeing it according to his timetable. When the prevailing cultural worldview is opposed to God and his word, which, by the way, America's is, the truly reverent Christian has to ask, these questions. What does the Bible say? Am I going to believe what the Bible says? Will I apply what the Bible says to my life and culture? What does it say? Do I believe it? And am I going to live it? Those are the decisions we need to make. So according to this, let me ask a question. Should the church water down the gospel to make it more appealing or less offensive in order to win people to Christ? When someone goes to court and is going to give a testimony, do they lay their hand on the Bible, raise the other and say, I swear to tell the truth as much as I can remember it and if I feel like it. No! I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So in our lives, are we willing to say, God, I believe your word, all your word, and only your word. And I'm going to live my life according to it. Not only when I feel like it, because it's not always comfortable to live according to God's word. Because sometimes, like Donna was saying when she was over here by herself, sometimes we swim alone. But God is with us. Many churches have swept reverence for God under the rug in order to make the gospel attractive and relevant. Many churches spend more time and money on packaging the gospel than presenting the power of it. In other words, are we all about beautifying our buildings and we send only a little bit schmuckine to missions? Where are our priorities? We should do as Daniel did. Lovingly deliver God's message of truth. That is reverence. Letting relevance come or go as God sees fit. A quote on our sheet says, The same boiling water that hardens the egg softens the carrot. I usually say it, the same sun that softens butter hardens concrete. Don't focus on the temperature of the water, but focus on the substance of what's in the water. What are we made of? Does God's presence, does God's word soften our hearts or do we allow it to harden our hearts? It depends on what we're made of, not God or his word. 
We brought Noah onto the scene with Daniel today. Let's look at Lot. He was the nephew of Abraham. Both Daniel and Lot were moved into positions of importance and influence in their respective sinful cities. Lot failed to influence his city positively. He tried to appease the pagans by offering his daughters to a sexually aggressive mob. What kind of father does that? He was trying to please man. God said he would spare the city if he found ten righteous people. Can you imagine only ten godly people in an entire town? Couldn't find them. Didn't have that many. Lot chose to appease man rather than appeal to God. He chose to be relevant instead of reverent. And Lot became the example of a person who gives in to the wicked while trying to be relevant. He was spared judgment, but he had zero influence over his culture. Daniel, however, remained faithful to God while in Babylon and became a leader and a person of godly influence. Church, we have a choice. He was in exile. He, you know what the meaning of the word exile basically is? Being someplace you don't want to be. You can be in exile on your job. Daniel and his friends were in exile. They weren't in some comfy, cushy situation where everything was going their way. They constantly had to swim upstream to do the godly and right thing. We have a choice. We can do the same as Daniel did. King Darius said this. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. I love that. Daniel was not only a man of God, but God was the God of Daniel. Can people say that about us? Oh, that's the God of Zenida. That's the God of Sini. Can people say those things about us? From our sheet, a position of influence with man will never compare with the pathway to inheritance with God. God has called us, us, us. God has called us to speak the truth and meet people's needs as Daniel and even Jesus did. And we can do that only if our reverence for God outweighs our desire to please man by trying to be first of all, most of all, relevant. And it must be genuine reverence, not just a form of godliness that misses out on the power that should accompany it. Isaiah 29, 13 says, this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service. What is lip service? We talk a good line about God. We know all the right words to say, the phrases to use. We know the songs. We know, we know, we know. And we pay lip service to it. But our lives don't back up what we say. That's lip service. These people, this people draw near to me with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me. They remove their hearts. If space develops between us and God, it's not God's fault. It's not God who moves. It's we who move. These people have removed their hearts far from me. Who can change the situation? We do by closing the gap, by drawing near to God again. They remove their hearts far from me and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. There's nothing wrong with tradition. 
How many of you have Christmas traditions, something you do every year? Nobody. Of course, that's one of the things that makes Christmas special. We get that warm, fuzzy feeling, even if it's 85 degrees, you know, it's, it's a different kind of thing than when you're in the snow and the cold. There's nothing wrong with tradition until we get so stuck in it. We're not willing to bring in anything else. We're not willing to um, move things into reality. Instead of just imagining it, it becomes reality for us. It's okay to have traditions, even in our worship. It's okay. As long as we don't get so mired into those traditions, we miss the speaking of the Holy Spirit to our hearts. Because we're so busy doing our thing, we don't allow time for God to do his thing in our hearts and among us. The people of Judah had outward piety without inward substance. So even if we observe traditions, it should come from somewhere down in here, substance in our hearts then tradition can become a beautiful thing. They had religious devotion without reverent hearts. Their hearts hadn't been transformed. They just repeated religious routines. Their relationship with God had become mere religious activity where we know exactly what's coming next. We even know exactly what the pastor is going to say. We know exactly what's going to happen. And the order it's going to happen, how long it'll last, who will do it. But what about the why? Why do we pray? Why do we sing? Why do we even gather? Even that can become tradition. It can become habit. It's Sunday, so we go to church. But why are we going? Why are we going? Why are we doing what we're doing? If we desire to live with the kind of conviction that Daniel did, we must choose every day to live reverently in the fear of God. So much so that we will do what he tells us to do as Noah did and as Lot didn't. Are we we open to God rocking our boat? Are we open to God telling us to do something different? To do something out of our comfort zone? Maybe we're just really comfortable being in the background, being one of those who pray for everybody else. But when God tells us, open our mouths and talk to him. Mm, Here am I, Lord. Send Bonnie. Right? We need to ask ourselves, for me, in my life, is it going to be tradition or transformation? Am I willing for God to transform me from the inside out? For me, is it going to be just mere routine or am I going to work at having a relationship with God? It can't be like the man who married his wife They got home from the wedding and she said, do you love me, honey? I said it at the wedding and if anything changes, I'll let you know. That's not a marriage. That's not a relationship. We can't have that kind of distant relationship with God. Just, you know, give him a wave, give him a nod once in a while. Show up at church once in a while. Do something else once in a while. Relationship takes consistency. It takes work. Is it going to be just routine for me? Or am I going to build a relationship with God? Because his word says, if we draw near to him, what? He'll draw near to us. God's a gentleman. He's not going to go where he's not invited, where he's not welcome. 
for me in my life, am I going to choose relevance or reverence? Am I going to do what pleases the world, what doesn't rock the boat, that doesn't look any different from the world because I don't want to stick out? We should be the most sticking out people in the world. Because living for Jesus doesn't look like living for the world. It just doesn't look like it. So how can we not stick out? You know what? It's a compliment when somebody draws attention to something about us that's different. How can you possibly have joy when your house just burned down? It's because we know the peace of God, which will bring the joy of God, no matter what our circumstances. It's a God thing in our hearts. Am I going to choose relevance or reverence? Because it'll make all the difference. If I revere God, if I put him first, if I listen to him, if I obey his word, he will make sure that I'm relevant to people when I need to be. Is that what I'm going to choose? God, I pray that you will help us to choose what's right, to choose what's best, to choose you first. Like the song we heard last week, put first things first. Put you first. You've promised that if we seek you and your kingdom, whatever else we need and even a lot of things we want will be given to us. You'll make sure of that. But God, may we seek you first. May we be way more concerned about being reverent before you than we are being relevant to the world, except when it makes a difference for you. Except, Lord, when it will draw people to you. Then relevance is important. God, help us. Help us to prioritize things in our hearts and in our lives and in our homes and on our jobs. God, may we first of all think, what would God have me do? It wasn't comfortable for Noah to build an ark. It wasn't easy. It wasn't popular. But in reverence to you, he obeyed you. God, help us to be like Noah. Help us to be like Daniel. Where that is our first priority in our family, in church, on our job, even as a neighbor. That God, we put you first. We reverence you. And then the rest will follow. Help us God, to glorify you throughout every part of our lives. To bring you glory, God. Be glorified through our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.